Welcome everyone to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Mark. How are you here? How am I where? How are you today? <laughs> there's time and then there's, there's space and time. Now, they're both a priori intuitions, as we know from Immanuel Kant, um, but they're important to distinguish. One relates to succession and one relates... Anyway, so uh, I'm doing well, thanks, Walker. How are you? I'm very good. We're going to talk about games today. We are going to talk about games. Have we? Be, are we becoming a sports podcast? No. Good. Because I, I, as little I know about anything, I know even less about sports. I'm sure we're, we compare alcohols to the games we played or sports, or we can we can go into just <laughs> small talk about about how you know the, the what we did this week. Here's a suggestion. All right. The weather. Taylor Swift true crime podcast. Oh my god. We would totally, we would get the listeners, and we're both experts on both of those topics. We could have an in-depth discussion about how Taylor Swift wrote a book, and now they're making a movie about it. I would just like to say, for the record, I do actually like her music. Don't come after me. Okay. So, uh, we're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And then we're going to talk about our feature game, which this week is Envelopes of Cash by Andy Schwartz. So, Walker, what did you play last week? Mark, you and I... Got to play a game called Aqua Biodiversity. We have to make sure we say biodiversity because there's yet another Aqua game that actually came out this year. Yes. That's based on art. So this is the biodiversity edition, not the art edition. It's true. This is designed by Dan Halstead and Tristan Halstead. Art by Vincent Dutrait and published by Sidekick Games. This is a review copy we got from the publisher. And it's very much in the in the sort of run as Calico or Cascadia. You have a pool of three tiles that you're choosing from, and then you uh, you start building your own tableau. In this one, unlike the other, some of the others, where you do a common one, this is your own, and you are trying to group up like colors of coral in order to put out smaller type of marine life you can also create sort of weirdly shaped reefs as well instead of the hexagons and if you actually get a group of small animals in a cluster that matches one of the shapes of the big sea critters and you can bring in a big sea critter there's all sorts of different types of scoring there's a a giant stack of tiles that will change every game and if you don't have any of those other ones, this <laughs> one would be fine. So it's very it's important, I think, to say a little bit more about the spectrum of the nature themed tile laying games, because insofar as there is a trend, that is absolutely one of the trends in terms of released games here. And on the spectrum of the friendliest, namely your more Cascadia end of the spectrum, to the my head hurts, why am I suffering so? To the other end, which which I would put on the calico spectrum, and in the middle, slightly closer to I think the the, the brain burning part, you have uh, race for the raft, for example, it's closer than some of the other ones. You have you have things like trailblazers, which are all very much in the middle of these two poles. I think Aqua is much closer to Cascadia. It is very friendly. It is family appropriate. It's very colorful. Vincent Dutre is one of my favorite board game artists, and it is a you know very much a, a visually attractive thing. It could be garish given the wrong application, but as it is, it's just very colorful. I don't think it went into the line of unpleasantly colorful. Obviously, tastes may differ. Uh, that having been said, I, I didn't really feel a lot of tension or interest going on. You build your shapes, you plop out your little animals. There's a little bit of interest in that the larger animals that you say, which is kind of a level three. First, you make a hex that that makes a small animal. You make a cluster of small animals. And then if you have a cluster of different colored small animals, you can put a larger animal on top of them. And that's the, bi- the biodiversity part. You know, your octopode, your your, your average octopode is not going to eat uh, two servings of crab in one sitting. That's just unhealthy. Not gluttonous yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to mix it up with a little bit of sea turtle, uh, maybe a little bit of, of something else on the side. And consequently, you get more points for that. And But the more interesting part is that activates a new scoring condition. And so you can get into some potentially complicated combinatorics, but not too wild and nothing too daunting, and that part is purely optional. Like, you don't have to have those quote-unquote advanced scoring conditions. And even if you do, you can try to make sure you have the simpler ones that are available, uh, e- even in terms of the ones that you're selecting to put out on your own board. So it was all right. Didn't find it particularly compelling. But then again, I haven't found a lot of these nature-themed tilings uh, especially compelling. And 
aside from the slight differences in theme and slight difference in visual presentation, I'm starting to feel that a fair number of them are somewhat interchangeable. If this is your bag, though, meh, this is yet another of a nature-themed yeah. approachable it, tile. It, I, I feel it's a little bit different than, not a, like, in that field, it is different than the rest, I think, with that little bit of, you know, double-layered sort of putting tiles on tiles. And, you know, it is it is... A little bit different. <laughs> oh, sure. I'm not. I'm, I don't mean that they're okay. When I say as, interchangeable, as as you, I know, but I know I, I agree with you with that. But I mean, like in the in that small niche of games, I think it is different enough that you would you could play both that's, if if that's your bag. Just I was just sort of just adding on to what you said. If it's your bag, that's fair. You know, the ability to trigger more advanced scoring conditions optionally yeah. is at least a little bit more flexible than say again your Cascadia, which has your set scoring conditions, and these are just the ones that you you get to pursue. Yeah. That is Aqua by Dan and Tristan Halstead, published by Sidekick Games. I get to play Imperium Horizons. Imperium Horizons is the new expandalone slash new set of Imperium. So it's the sequel to Imperium Classics and Imperium Legends. This is a review copy sent to us by the publisher, designed by Nigel Buckle and David Terze. Now, Nigel Buckle and David Terze, since publishing Imperium, then published our Game of the Year 2023 Voidfall. And on top of that, I was already big into the Imperium system. And so I was very, very curious to see what they were going to be doing with it with Horizons. Let me split up my discussions of Horizons into three buckets. All right. So bucket the first is... What is it like when a system has a new expand alone, right? We've all been there, right? You're the early adopter. You've got the early sets. Is it the case that you have to worry about obsolescence? Is it the case you're going to have to worry about incompatibilities? Is it the case you're going to start having sprawling rule books where information is scattered all over the place? When done well, independently of whether I like the game system, I think a new addition can be really a joy, especially for a collector and as a gamer. And when it's a system I already like, that joy is compounded. Imperium Horizons does this in spades. It is a fabulous new addition. The rulebook is comprehensive, expanded, and clarified. It has all the information for the classics and legend sets as well. It has completely unnecessary but welcome new cards to run the solo modes for all the old civilizations. Previously, what you had to do was use the back of the rulebook or print out the ones that were eroded, but now... So there's a whole bunch of new content for all the original sets. There have been very minor balance fixes that are entirely optional. I've gone over most of the changes, just looking at, at, at the differences. And according to the designers as well, this isn't the kind of thing where you really need to go and get the, the new cards. But the new cards help make the new mechanisms integrate better with the existing stuff. This is how to do it. You now only need one rulebook. You don't need all the rest of the stuff. New components. Wonderful. Very, very much appreciate it when they go the extra care for new editions like this, because otherwise series can get very, very sprawling very, very quickly. So that I'm a big fan of. The second bucket is the new content in the form of new civilizations. And once again, Imperium continues to present civilizations that don't tend to make the top list of your Sid Meier's or even of sometimes your Tresham derivative civilization games. It's, it's true. I've not yet seen Martians in any of those games. Yeah. So there are a couple that are just wacky. So in the base sets, there were the Atlanteans. Now there are Martians. There are cultists. But you also find the Taino, you find the Inuit, you find the Sassanids, you find the Akkadians. You, I mean, all these uh, civilizations that tend not to be represented very, very often. And, you know, it, like the number of civilization games that go through a number of iterations and never get past North Africa, that's the overwhelming majority. And now we have several in the Southern Hemisphere, let, al uh, let alone just from the Americas. It, it's, it's great. I really appreciate that. And that really helps me learn something new every time I play the game. Did you look through the Martian deck? Is it like Martians trying to survive on Earth, or is it all just sort of wacky space Martian stuff? <laughs> uh, there's not really... They don't really come to grips with the uh, trenchant difficulties of Martians trying to integrate with human civilization God. necessarily. I wouldn't go that far. But I haven't played them yet, so who's to say? I haven't gone through their decks with a fine-tooth comb. But I got to play as the Sassanids. The Sassanids were the last Persian dynasty before the Arab conquests of the 7th and 8th centuries, which is a particular interest to me for a variety of reasons. I'm intrigued by Zoroastrianism. By looking up the cards, I actually learned a couple new things about Zoroastrianism. Uh, this is also the period of time immediately following the Sassanid Empire was the period of time represented in the Martin Wallace game Byzantium, which I very much like. So the Persians are very much in decline at that point. Anyway, so there's a lot to like. Then there's the third thing, the third bucket, which is the new mechanisms. 
Specifically, there's a trade module. When setting up Imperium now, you can either play with the trading uh, uh, rules or without the trading rules. First of all, there's a little bit of setup obnoxiousness in terms of which cards to include in which deck. So yet more sorting that has to be done before the game actually starts. Not ideal. And I'm only one play deep into the trade module. I've seen some of the other non-trading uh, focused civilizations in Imperium Horizons, but I'm only one play deep into the trading module. And it was the classic thing that a lot of expansions do. It's the one extra thing that you don't pay attention to. It's the thing off to the side. Ideally, what the trading module does is, what again, what expansions ought to do ideally, which is deal with some of the shortcomings of the base design or perceived shortcomings of the base design. Imperium has always been varying shades of multiplayer solitaire, not a whole heck of a lot of player interaction. And I'm okay with that. I came to peace with that about Imperium. And trading, in theory, is supposed to allow you to start activating other people's cards for mutual benefit. It's really hard to see what is across the table. It's really hard to generate the effect and the resources that let you do that. And while you're busy managing your own empire, for example, the Sassanid Empire is fascinating in that you have to manage garrisoning a whole bunch of different cards across a whole bunch of different terrains. It really, I really felt like I was managing far-flung provinces in a very real way. I didn't have enough bandwidth left to start worrying about trading. Now, again, this is the first time playing with the new module, but I've played Imperium a bunch of times, and it definitely felt like on First Blush to be that one step too far. So I'm curious to see how it shakes out in the context of other trade-focused civilizations. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm really gonna see if I can force myself to engage with it in a meaningful way by choosing a civilization that is yet more trade-focused. The Sassanids have a built-in trading element, but not not to the extent that others do, I think. And so I'm looking forward to exploring that. All in all, though, I am a huge fan of what they did with Imperium Horizons. Even though I don't necessarily appreciate what the trade module added to, the, uh, to, to my attempts with it, I appreciate what they were trying to do with it. And overall, the nature of the production and the quality of making sure that everything fit together in a nice way so that it's not a sprawling, complicated series in the unpleasant fashions is marvelous. Uh, so far, the only offerings that I've ever played from Nigel Buckle and David Surtse as co-designers is Voidfall and Imperium. And I'm huge fans of both of those designs. So I remember a designer diary from a few years ago where David Surtse said that Nigel Buckle was the best designer you've never heard of. And I'm certainly willing to believe that claim based on early results of their collaborations. So Imperium Horizons, absolutely a great place to get started in the Imperium setting if you're inclined. And especially since if you then go and get the Imperium classics and Legends boxes, you'll already have some corrected material and some uh, handy player aids for the solo version. I am very, very pro what they did with Imperium Horizons. Hats off to Osprey for doing a solid job for what could have been a miss. And I am looking forward to exploring yet more of the 19 different peoples introduced in Imperium Horizons. It's a lot of cards. It is. Mark, you and I got to play another review copy, which is called World Wonders. This is designed by... Zay Mendez, the same designer that designed Brazil Imperial, if, in case you're wondering, uh, put out by Meeple BR, which I'm, is means uh, Brazil, Meeple Brazil, I'm sure what it means. And this is sort of a game in the ilk of Mad King Ludwig, I think. It's sort of you're putting out tiles and you're trying to put them together in a certain way that will help you score points because these wonders will... Uh, flip up every turn and you have to be able to place them adjacent to certain types of buildings that you're building to get points and you have roads that some wonders need to be beside as well so you're ma manipulating these sort of blocky tetris pieces in order to leave openings so you can fit these wonders on which are very nice wooden meeples that make your personal little maps very pleasant they're these beautiful pieces. They're screen printed and painted uniquely. So you've got Petra, you've got uh, a lot of the classics. You've got the Temple of Ishtar and you've... you've Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat. You've got the East Moai. Dry, Easter Island heads. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the comparison that I would make is to another tile laying game, which is to say Foundations of Rome. Foundations of Rome, let's be honest here, whether you like the game or not, Foundations of Rome gets by to a non-trivial extent on its charm and its visual impact. Right, you know these massive quantities of plastic, the metal start player marker that is entirely superfluous, and between the two of those, 
I would vastly prefer World Wonders because World Wonders, you get a lot of the same visual appeal. Now, it's, it's, it's very different. We're not talking about large shaded pieces of plastic. We're talking about much smaller pieces of wood coexisting with simple cardboard tiles. But rather than a massive crate that costs several hundred dollars, you get a reasonably sized box at 40 and you nonetheless get a lot of visual appeal and uniqueness to the tiles that you're laying out. Now, all of that having been said, one thing that I find rather crushingly disappointing about World Wonders, though, I've played it solo and I've played it multiplayer. In both instances, your final score, your actual wonders were a drop in the bucket. And it's one of those things where this is not just me getting a fixed idea. It's the name of the game. It's the most impressive piece of of material in the game. And it's also a, a major element of the puzzle feature. It's just figuring out how to satisfy the conditions. And frequently you might end up in the position where the conditions you went through to satisfy the prerequisites of the wonder are far more valuable in terms of your actual net points. So when you're, it's a little disappointing and I think a little deflating at the end of the game. You're like, look, I, I built all these wonders and they got me five points and the rest of my board got me 20. Okay. Oh, well. And <laughs> it's just, I, I find it a little discordant and consequently it makes me a little less down on the, uh, ultimately the toyetic factor of World Wonders. It is very, very cool looking and I do like manipulating all the, 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 the little wonders and stuff. And even though I'm now in a position where I know that going for wonders isn't necessarily the most bankable strategy, I'm still going to do it because they're so cool looking. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting. I, I like the game. It's the timing mechanism is very interesting. The fact that wonders will come up and either some people can build them right that turn or there's a key puzzle piece there that the first player is bound to take or a couple, you know what I mean? So like the like being first player or not is very important. And the moment that you build the wonder, your turn is over. It's the same sort of sort of uh, blood rage sort of thing. You have, you know, nine rage points in which you're going to use to spend to buy tiles or put in roads. But the moment that you build that wonder, you lose all the rest of the gold and uh, your turn is done. So very interesting timing considerations. And it dovetails with the economy of World Wonders, which is appropriately simple and add to that tension because buildings cost a various amount, roads cost a, a, a gold. You cannot increase your gold production. You can take it alone. But other than that, it's not like you're building infrastructure. This is a very straightforward tile layer. It knows exactly what it's doing. And the cost of building a wonder is however much gold you have left. <laughs> so it's it's not like one of those Civ type or Civ adjacent type experiences where you have to save up multiple turns to build the wonder or whatever. No, no, no. It's quick and breezy. Oh, you've satisfied the conditions? Go ahead, build the pyramids. You got a buck left? Oh, the pyramids cost a buck. That I appreciate. It's focused. It's tight. The timing considerations are nice. I would like the timing considerations more if I knew that the wonders, again, were more determinative for the scoring because you end up in this dance where it's like, well, I could wait and theoretically build the wonder for one, but someone else might take it, so I'll just build the wonder for four. And again, that's a trade-off I'm willing to do, but I know that I'm not playing optimally when I do that. And I'm not super competitive. It's just I wish the scoring represented the value of the wonders a little bit more. Look, I respect the fact that there was possibly it was an attempt to make the game feel less arbitrary because of what's available at the given time or what preconditions or prerequisites you might have built by accident or what have you. Sure, fine, whatever. But all told, I, I wish that the... The scoring had, had been a little bit more in tone with the theme and the materials of World Wonders because I, I very much appreciate a lot of what else it's trying to do. And if you have other Civ games, I was thinking you could use all these pieces for your other Civ games. Yeah. They're already all painted and look lovely and you just have them out on the side. And when you build a wonder, you can put out these nicely painted meeples. It's true. And that is World Wonders by Zay Mendez, distributed in North America by Arcane Wonders. Walker, we get to play Mlem, Space Agency. Now, originally, I had thought that it was supposed to be like Meow Lunar Exploration Module because the Lem is a famous thing. In space. However, I've now done research. We are a very rigorous podcast here. I have done research. Uh, do you know what Mlem means? Uh, it's something to do with a cat thing when they stick their tongue out. Yes. Yeah. It is when cats or dogs have their tongue hanging out. 
This was no, my, just cats. There's just a different, oh, no, there's a different. No, 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 no. My understanding is, oh, okay, well, this is this is because there's an expansion. There's an expansion. There's a mini the module box. expansion with puppies, and it's called Blep. My understanding is that Blep is a different thing with the. Puppy. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Now uh, maybe this is just a, a doctrinal factional difference because the cat people and the dog people, most of the time, they get they get on fine on the internet, but every once in a while, there are doctrinal issues. It's oh, really, really. That's what I did. Anyway, so Malem Space Agency is a dice game by Reiner Knizia, and Reiner Knizia knows him some dice games. One thing, though, that he hates, I've just observed this about a number of Reiner Knizia dice games, he seems to hate the number six. Yeah, no dice may have six. No dice may have six. He's done this a bunch of times in his dice games, uh, even in my island and in my city, no six on the die. So there you go. And there's a really interesting dynamic going on in Lem Space Agency. Every round, someone is uh, going to be the captain. They get to send one of their cats. Everyone has the same complement of cats cat astronauts, and everyone else files in. And the person who is nominally running the show can disembark at any time. They have a little bit of control over how far the rocket moves based on how they're, they're rolling the dice. St- pretty standard push-your-luck element. It really gives me the feel of can't stop. Yeah. Is that there's like certain dice combinations that you want. You're pushing your luck. You're trying to get further up the thing, and you could just lose out completely. But it evolves over the course of the round. Yes. For and sure. you have to worry about what dice you spend in throw one by virtue of what's going to happen in throw two and what space you're on, and this is actually quite neat, influences what dice you can use. And you do have to internalize that there are more twos on the dice than anything else, and so it is much safer to be on a space with twos. Anyhow, and the downside of this, though, so the captain has a little bit more control over where the rocket goes, but they have to dis- decide whether or not to disembark first. Which, there's a little bit of pressure. That's a, that's a good news, bad news situation, because they have first pick, and if they show up first at a, an area majority area, they get to break ties. But if they leave, then the next cat, because you know how it is with cats, right? Yeah. They just come and go as they please, and then the next cat is like, oh, there's a vacant chair. I guess I'm in charge now. Just so. And then they get to go. Anyway, that dynamic I thought was really cool. And unsurprisingly, uh, I, I don't think I've ever really encountered a Ryan Knizia dice game I don't enjoy. He really knows how to manipulate probability. It's kind of his thing. And I thought that Mlem was uh, was pretty charming. The theming is really weird. I mean, as I've constantly said, though, if you're going to design a Euro game, it can be about anything. And this isn't quite... Anth- <sighs> yeah, I know they're anthropomorphic animals. They I'm are, sorry. but they're, they're a little more. Is, they're a little yeah. more animalistic. Yeah. Right? Again, on a spectrum of like... They're just people with animal heads all the way to animals. They're definitely closer to animals than a lot of anthropomorphic animal games, but it's another anthropomorphic animal game. <laughs> what did you think of Mlem Walker? You played it twice, actually. I did. Right? So Mark, Mark and I played a two-player, and then we streamed it on Saturday. So if you want to see it played, you can and pop on the YouTube channel and check it out. We played it four players. We also played with the UFO module. It comes with uh, three or four different modules that you can add on or play with all of them. The UFO one was you would flip over a tile and... And it would reduce, or you you start with six dice, and it would tell you if that was less or more, and then it gave you like a one-time, you know, dice token. So you could cash it in for whatever dice was shown on the token, and if you happened to hit exactly where the, the UFO was on the track, then you'd get extra points. Uh, I felt as though it really reduced, because a lot of times we only started with four dice, right? So it really reduced how far the rocket was going. Yeah. I'm not sure if I had play with it all the time. I really liked it. It was a really interesting push your luck gun game. All of your astronauts have special abilities that, you know, manipulate how all of those rules work. Easy to teach. Like like I said, it has that feeling of can't stop, which I enjoy. And a continuing trend of shockingly affordable games with neoprene in them. Yes. Like, Unnecessary neoprene. Yeah, but. crazy long, thin map, much like uh, Flamecraft. Yes. Well, it's difficult to have a wide neoprene mat without making the box huge. True. So there you have it. So this is by Rebel Studios, the same one that did the Reiner Knizia San Francisco game. Well, there you go. There you go. Mark, you and I tried to play Mask Men, but after the, after we played uh, Mlem on the stream, we had a four-player game of Masked Men. Ah. Th- now, this is an interesting game. Luckily, Sidewinder and, and Warm Boy had played it before. Oh, good. They said they played it in a bar atmosphere i I don't know how that would work (laughs) because this is a game very much like no other 
because what you're doing is that you're ranking the cards as you're playing them. So yes, it's, it a, a, it's a wrestling theme. You throw a wrestler luchador out there. Theme. Luchador theme. You're this is throwing, the sports episode, Walker. You throw a wrestler out there. Actually, yeah, that could be my next. Anyway, you, throw, <laughs> you throw a wrestler out there. And if it's, it's uh, if you ever played A-hole at high school. Yeah, it's a climbing game. It yeah. had a climbing game. It had a very much feel of that. You're trying to shed away your low cards but of course at the beginning while you're looking at your cards you have no idea what the low cards are right um i never during the game manipulated the ranking to my favor but but i i because of my experience with with those games i just by shedding the cards quickly it worked out it's very interesting i really much enjoy it this is designed by jun saki and taiaki and put out by oink games And so you have all these different luchador masks and you're going to be putting them in rows to show the ranking system of the cards as you go through each round, four rounds for like four seasons of wrestling, I guess. And it's sort of like... Yeah, wrestling wrestling is very seasonal. Exactly. You have your summer submission holds, you have your fall submission holds. It's very much like, sometimes it turns into like a deduction figuring out game it's like well if the blue wrestler beat the pink wrestler and the pink wrestler is stronger than the green wrestler and if the green wrestler beat the blue wrestler yeah this is an implied science that now the green wrestler yep. green wrestler will go here and well that, that's why the one play that we had was aborted because uh now most of the fault was mine because you kept going on the right track you were like 90 to 95 percent certain about how something would work but that five to ten percent of doubt would cause me to think that this was a weird kind of elaboration on studying for the LSATs or something. One of those weird logic puzzles where it's like, well, Sandy has a red sweater and will not sit to the left of Bruno. And Bruno will will only wear a primary color sweat, blah, 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 blah. And I was just unable to parse what card plays were permissible where. And to be frank, we're not alone. For a very, very simple game, all OIC games are, are tend to be very simple. This was one of those cases where the rule book was excessively simple, ultimately. If you go online to the Board Game Geek entry from Askman, you will find many, many more threads of rules questions and attempts to re-explain the rules. Someone wrote a web app to explain how the game works. You don't see that for fake artist goes to New York. <laughs> no, you do not. And... So at least I feel like I'm in good company. I think I understand how the game works now. I'd be vaguely curious to try it again. Uh, I have to say, though, that in terms of climbing games, uh, based on my perception, even just uh, based on the, the board play and now my understanding of the rules, I think I'd still rather play Scout. Scout at least gives you the ability to manipulate what's going on in your hand and do something with that lone two you're otherwise never going to uh, never gonna shed. If you're playing Maskman and you're stuck with, with a, a singleton of some weak wrestler, mm, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't let that happen. Well... <laughs> You, you act as though there's some control yeah. over that. Some, sometimes you have control, sometimes you don't. It's like, true. You're not sure with that lone card, you're hoping that it's going to be highly ranked. And then, yeah. Yeah. No, it can never, yeah, a single card can never be highly ranked. So yeah. Well, so you, you can do very little to ensure that it will be highly yes. ranked. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, uh, but I, I, I'd happily try it. Oink Games is one of those publishers that has a devoted fan base. I can understand why. Those 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 little chibi boxes are so adorable. That's amazing. Yeah. Love Max Men. We'll keep it. Where are you going to find room for it? I don't know. It's so huge. Yeah. It's luchadors. They're, they're massive. Well, some are. Yes. Some of them are live. True. It's true. Simpere como colibra. Anyway, got to play the Barracks Emperors. This is a review copy sent to us by the publisher. Designed by Ray Farrell and Brad Johnson. These are the same designers who co-designed the deck building slash time of crisis war game called Time of Crisis which was interesting and cool, but fell right into the pit of problems that we'll identify as the standard multiplayer troops on a map conflict problems uh, real hard. And so consequently, I very much enjoyed a couple plays, but after that, it started getting very wonky in all the standard uh, traditional ways. Anyway, they reuse a lot of the same ideas and indeed the time period for the Barracks Emperors, but this is not a troops on a map game. This is not a deck construction game. This isn't a war game at all. There's no conflict. There's no direct conflict, except in the sense that it is kind of sort of a trick game where you're playing 13 tricks simultaneously. 
Now, you might think that this would cause your brain to explode and dribble out your ear hole, because if you've ever played or heard us talk about Ghosts of Christmas, where you're playing three or four tricks simultaneously, it can get really really hard to wrap your head around the implications. The Barracks Emperor is comparatively simpler and yet more directly interactive, because the way the tricks are arranged is that the tricks over which the cards over which you will be fighting are arranged in a checkerboard pattern, so an offset grid. So there are four spaces around each card that you're fighting over. You can only play to one of those positions, so you might only be playing to the north side, or you may only be playing to the east side. But you might be thinking, but wait, Mark, if I'm playing south, and you're playing north, and you play a card to the north, doesn't that block a position to the south of some other card? The answer is yes. And that's where the game gets wild, and super Super interesting, because every card play you make is a card play for each of your opponents. And so you have to manage this while navigating the special powers and the trump. The core systems of the Barracks Emperors are one of the most interesting trick-taking games I've seen in years. I think the last time I was my head was this blown by a trick-taker was when I played Pala over ten years ago. And as interesting as I find Ghosts of Christmas, it can get super arbitrary in an unexpected way based on what color happens to be lead and suddenly everything's gone gone weird. The Barracks Emperors gives you a lot more control in terms of manipulating what your opponents are going to be doing. The part that where I think some people are going to get off the train is the special powers. Every card has a special power. And they're all simple, but some of them are directly confrontational. So, for example, one of them is a mob. You play the mob, and then you flip someone else's card face down that's already competing for that trick. That card is now a nothing card. Oh, well. <laughs> now, again, every card is a card play for multiple people at once, so in so doing, you might actually be kneecapping yourself as well. But in practice, you can find ways around that. Not all the cards are that directly confrontational. There's usually a counter, a way around a variety of things. But I would say that if your, uh, your frustration threshold is very, very low, you might not enjoy the Barracks Emperors. I thoroughly enjoyed the Barracks Emperors. I thought it was wild. Really, really well done. Really novel. Potential downsides, other than the low th frustration threshold possibility, this is only a game for four players. You need the full complement of four. It won't go to five. You can play with two or three. Or, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. It's got solo rules that I've not yet investigated. We'll see. They look reasonably straightforward, so I'll give it a shot and report back. But I really like the Barracks Emperors. When GMT Games tries to publish slightly more mass market stuff, sometimes you end up with really interesting designs. And the Barracks Emperors is absolutely fascinating. I thought it was really, really, really well done and enjoyable whether or not you like trick-taking games because of how it plays with the formula. Highly recommended. Looking forward to subsequent plays. The Barracks Emperors was a real hit. You know, I got to play a review copy of Tokyo Highway Rainbow City. This is a game that's on Kickstarter right now. Still has 16 days to go. This is designed by... Naotaka Shimamoto and Yoshiaki Tomioka. It's published by Itten Games. So there was... We played the original Tokyo Highway, and we had fairly large misgivings about it when yeah. we played it. It was all c completely wood. And so you have these long popsicle stick-like roads that are going to go on columns as and they get different of different sizes, and then you're going to put be putting on wooden cars on these popsicle sticks, and so you can sort of see how much these things would slide around. Yeah. The cars would never stay on the roads if there was any sort of angle on them, and things just. Well, not, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it not a uh, yeah a bit a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> Um, so the new one, Rainbow City, it is a 100% turnaround. They have these rubber, uh, bottoms on all the roads. So they stick, so they don't slide around. The, all the cars are made of full rubber. So they just plop onto the streets. Uh, it is, makes it way more playable, a lot more enjoyable and waiting to play more. So Tokyo Highway, the base game version was in a very real way, simultaneously, too much of a dexterity game and not enough of a dexterity game. As Walker said, the pieces would slide around like crazy, and you would frequently end up in repeated disaster situations where a car falls off, you try to put it back on, this causes something else to fall off, the car falls off again, etc. And you have these interminable turns where someone's just leaning over and dealing with frustration. And the other problem was, it's not really a dexterity game in terms of how it's trying to get you to win. It's more kind of sort of uh, an abstract... Uh, free positioning game, kind of like Lacuna in that there's not a board, 
uh, but you're still playing kind of sort of a positional abstract sort of situation. Tokyo Highway Rainbow, Rainbow City solves both of those problems very adeptly. First of all, in the component upgrades that Walker talked about, so there are two versions of the product. You can get the expansion version, which will come with new cars and little rubber stickers that you can put on your adi- uh, uh, existing rows, roads, or you can get the expand alone, which has all the new components, as well as, crucially in this case, the eponymous rainbow of Rainbow City. So in the base game of Tokyo Highway, there were these buildings. So you got kind of an abstract sense of a skyline that you were building these roads around. And the final product was visually interesting. Rainbow City dials that up to 11. There's an airport, there's a there's a stadium, there are more buildings, there are development areas, and consequently, very early on in your game of Tokyo Highway Rain- Rainbow City, you have a game state which I would classify as highly Instagrammable. There's a technical term that we use in board game criticism that in no way should be interpreted as an indication that I know anything about the social meds. The clicky clacks. Yes, it is, but it's just very visually engaging, and it offers some grist for the mill of the decisions about where you're going to be situating roads because of things that are going to be in the way, various point opportunities that you'll be pursuing. I think that Tokyo Highway Rainbow City is a great example of how to make an expansion address some of the concerns you might have had with the base game, as well as doubling down on its strengths. It took a product that we really wanted to like but couldn't quite, and now it's something that's really, really neat. And uh, an obvious comparison, I think, can be drawn to Kurtzwar Knopp in that it was similarly about, you know, making these long sticks on top of stacks. Uh, but I would rather play Tokyo Highway or Rainbow City, both because it's more visually engaging, it doesn't have the weird interrupt rules, and as well, you're not judging distances. You, you know, you can fiddle with things as you're building them. Judging a distance is helpful in terms of plotting out your future road planning, but it is not the the sort of sine qua non of what you are going to be doing over the course of the game. So Tokyo Highway Rainbow City, I think, is 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 a most excellent iteration on something that we wanted to like. I'm very eager to go back to it as well. Yeah, because so many dexterity games fall short when it comes to like either victory points or end game, right? And right. This, and this does not fall into any of those problems. Yeah, yeah. So far, the the victory planning actually seems to be surprisingly robust. There's a new module that uh, changes the earlier victory condition of just getting rid of all your cars to a slightly more nuanced thing. It's called the missions module. And I'm looking forward to exploring that, seeing if it holds up. But as I say, uh, I'm happy with the fact that you still get a, a quick experience with components that are pleasant to manipulate, much more pleasant than they were before, and a visual state that is far more engaging than it used to be. And those are, you cannot deny the aesthetic and tactile elements of Dexterity Games. It's one of the reasons why we love them. And Rainbow City is definitely a tremendous step forward in both of those criteria. That's Tokyo Highway, Rainbow City, now on Kickstarter. We got to play Vengeance, designed by Gordon Clea and published by Mighty Boards. And we've talked about this game multiple times. You take a hero and you put him through... Hero? Te- hero... <laughs> anti-hero, kind of hero. Wrong victim, wronged person. Wronged person, and you put them through through awful tribulations and pain and suffering. Oh, no, I didn't do that. Those and were the gangs. Those were the gangs. The yeah. gangs did that. I didn't do it. And then the gangs pay. Oh, they will pay. <laughs> and and the, there's two games. There's the roll and fight, and there's the normal vengeance, and the way they feel so similar and do such a great job at this sort of genre if you have the extra time, you play Vengeance. If you have just a short amount of time, you play the roll and fight, and you get almost the same sort of feeling from both of them. Yeah, they both operate on a similar approach to the sort of tactical combat puzzle that you get from manipulating dice results. I have to say that uh, one aspect that continues to bother me a little bit about Vengeance is I would feel comfortable if there was just a little bit more dice manipulation than there is. I mean, the the difference between... You're basically going to be tossing, at best, 12-ish dice over the course of a fight, and you don't get re-rolls. You in purchase abilities to manipulate the dice, and in that, there's a lot of texture, both in terms of purchasing them and then using them once they actually come. But I would feel better if there was a little bit more room to maneuver, as it were, in terms of manipulating the dice. Because, for example, uh, Huey... Uh, it, Vengeance is one of Huey's favorite games, and we can see why. But in some of his first couple runs, he was just rolling the the, the bad results over and over. And the, the, the distance between rolling two enemy activation results on your four dice, so half of your die result is just dealing you wounds, as opposed to some of the other runs where we would roll no enemy activation results reliably. Eh, and there's not a whole lot of, you can do about that. 
All of that having been said, one of the reasons why Vengeance keeps hitting the table and one of the reasons why it's uh, one of Huey's favorite games is I really do think it's one of the the top games of all times in terms of thematic integration. It wants to be a revenge movie. It wants to be a blood-soaked revenge movie in the tradition of Kill Bill or Old Boy. Old Boy is the greatest film ever made. And it absolutely succeeds at doing that. There's a thematic traction behind almost everything that happens, and it makes sense, and it hangs together in a very satisfying way. And just watching all those thugs get mowed down by your avatar of vengeance remains incredibly satisfying. These are the people that hurt me, Mark. It's true. Now they will suffer. <laughs> the There's a Shona proverb that is printed on the game manual. The axe forgets, but the tree remembers. Nice. <laughs> it's a very good proverb. And that is Vengeance by Mighty Boards. We get to try a game called Charioteer. This is also a review copy sent to us by GMT Games. This is a racing game designed by Matt Calkins. Matt Calkins has designed another design with GMT Games, namely... Seki Gahara. Seki Gahara is extremely interesting and very clever and novel. And I'm a I'm a big appreciator of his design work. It's one of those games that I very much enjoy, but I respect more than I enjoy. Whereas Charioteer, I think, is just a pure crowd pleaser. It is extraordinarily well done. One of the reasons why I was optimistic about Charioteer was because when reading the designer notes on the back of the rulebook, uh, Matt Calkins basically explains all the criteria that I want out of a racing game. So he says, well, you know, dice are fine, but if you don't really manipulate the dice, I, I, that's not the kind of game that I find super interesting. I'm like, okay, subtle dig at Formula Day, got it. And he also pointed out the thing that we've been complaining about for years, which is, why do most racing games feel so slow? And <laughs> You know, you're rounding up the, the final lap. It's like, we've been here for two and a half hours. Could someone please cross the finish line? Another thing he points out is that a lot of racing games, again, Formula Day, ask you to evaluate whether or not you want to take damage, but it's very attenuated. It's very, you're going to be fine until you're not. You know, your first few points of damage don't do anything, and so you think you're going to be fine, and then suddenly you get the last points of damage, and suddenly you've blown out, and it's a huge deal. And so it makes your early turns very, very difficult to plan. Charioteer has much less damage to manage than a lot of other racing games do. Make no mistake, this is not a Circus Maximus type of situation. You're not going to be throwing punches at your neighboring chariot chariots. You're not going to be hitting them with whips and so forth. There's a way to damage everybody else, but it's very abstracted and, and, and kind of minimized in terms of wear and tear. And getting rid of wear and tear is relatively easy. This is a game about hand management and about finding combos and planning for future combos. And consequently, there's a tremendous amount of dynamism. The winner of the race was in last place uh, for various elements of lap one. Some other people went from last place to second place, from first place to last. There was a lot of movement and fluidity. I was thoroughly impressed by Chariot here. Yeah, I liked everything about it. Almost better than Formula Day, in my opinion. This is a race game done right. The flow is there. It has this interesting sort of uh, central card mechanism where you get to play three cards from your hand and you can also use a fourth card from the middle if it matches if it matches, yeah. if it matches what you're playing there's also leveling up your chariot you know you get to move the 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 symbols that you rolled you get to move that up and it's going to slowly add more movement to your chariot there's the yeah so the game ramps up consequently yeah, yeah. there's an emperor die and if you match that then you're going twice on that track lots of things to do you can even block the damage that's put out put out the damage there's interesting cornering rules all of these things great game yeah and we played it with five it is a game whose player count is listed two to six and i was a little bit nervous because again you know just because i've been hearing designers talk about how race games need to be snappy and not last all day for years and then they frequently design games that do do just that and i knew the charioteer was trying to make sure that there was a bit of an arc you know, the skills ramp up, the the things things literally accelerate so that the third uh, lap actually goes much faster than the previous ones if people have been leveling up properly. And so I was nervous to play with near the maximum player count because I thought that things might drag. But no, it, it moved at a snappy pace and it accommodated the large player count really, really well. Uh, it, the box estimates one hour. This is still a wild overestimation, but it was, it was uh, you know, solid 75 to 90 minutes once people know what they were doing. Very simple game. There were a number of pernicious rules misunderstandings. I don't know if that's the game fault, uh, game's fault or my fault. We'll have to see on subsequent playings. 
But I thought the chariot here was a real winner, and I have to really think that it accomplished what it set out to do in terms of Matt Culkin's articulated design goals, which, for what it's worth, are exactly the priorities I want out of a race game. So there you have it. Yeah, it has this great sort of draw bonuses from a bag mechanism that makes it stand apart from everything else. Charioteer. Those are the games we played last week. And now a brief break while we pay some bills. And we're back. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Well, I have uh, a free day now, so I have a new thing, Mark. I'm decided I'm going to call it Wednesdays with Walker. <laughs> so we're doing streaming Wednesday mornings. I have already done it twice. If you want more Bloodstones content, I did the first two solo missions of Bloodstones, doing the third this coming Wednesday. Also going to unbox all of the new Kingdom Rush stuff. And then on the following Wednesday, we'll start some Kingdom Rush games on Wednesdays. So yeah, if you are into streaming and want to see some games, come check it out on Twitch. So you may recall when we discussed Dexterity Games, I lamented the fact that David Thompson and Reiner Kennedy as well, but David Thompson had not really published Dexterity Games. Well, I, I have some news. It is the case that there are no plans to publish any David Thompson Dexterity Games, but it is the case there is an unpublished design by Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson, Trevor Benjamin being his most frequent collaborator, though by no means his only, that is a pick-up-and-deliver dexterity game called Flicketeers. Now, I would just point out, I'm not one to offer notes. Certainly not not to, to people as talented as Trevor Benjamin or no, David Thompson. Are, no. But flick-up-and-deliver is right there. It's right there. <laughs> anyway, publishers, get on this. I want five copies of Flicketeers. Make it happen. Make it happen. Storm Raiders. This is how how much news there is this week. There is a game on Kickstarter named Storm Raiders, and I'm very interested in it. This is by uh, Shem Phillips. A lot of people like enjoy his games. Uh, you know, courtes courtesans of the of the West. <laughs> Red Light District. And I shouldn't well, say this because every time I, I, I offer one of these fake names, then then one comes out next week. So i, I got to right. be careful of what I say. <laughs> so, yes, Storm Raiders. It's sort of a post-apocalyptic. There's a giant sort of like uh, Dune slash Rex thing that moves around the map every turn and destroys stuff in its wake. Pick up and deliver game. The, the production looks like it's going to be very interesting. Storm Raiders. Check it out. I think you would have talked about it regardless of how much news there were. You are super enthusiastic about Storm Raiders. Yeah, Storm Raiders is good. Yeah. There's a very talented individual online by the name of Mark Hutchinson who has made a Voidfall solo web app. So if you want to play Voidfall online, uh, you can do so. You can do so only in the solo mode, granted. But it is fully featured, fully automated, and quite snappy. And the visual presentation is pretty darn good. That's one of those are often some of the complaints that I have about online implementations about board games, but it's really quite impressive, and it has received the official approval—not necessarily imprimatur or endorsement, but approval—of Mind Clash Games. So if you want to go give it a try, the in the episode notes we have a link to the Board Game Geek forum where he announces the project. I've uh, played a little bit; of it. it's quite impressive. Now, again, solo is not my preferred way to play Voidfall. I don't really like the solo and co-op modules, but it's well done. Voidfall Online. And that is the news, and why it doesn't matter. Now on to our feature game, which is Envelopes of Cash. Envelopes of Cash was designed by Andy Schwartz and published by Envelopes of Cash LLC after a, I'm going to say successful crowdfunding, but if you read some of his updates, it redefines what success is in the terms of crowdfunding. I think it's a success because I've got a copy of Envelopes of Cash, and that makes me very happy. This, however, is a review copy sent to us by the designer. Andy Schwartz studies antitrust law specifically as it applies to the economics of collegial sports. There will be more to say about that later. Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in, in, in Envelopes of Cash? Well, usually I have a silly sort of story about the game, but the game itself does the job <laughs> itself. So there's not much to say except... Envelopes of cash is a you're under constant management. You got to manage your resources. You got to manage your hand. You're looking at the pool. You're looking at the cards that you're going to draw. You have to sort of figure out where in the year you're going to place your resources so you can play the cards. And all of these things are happening at the same time. I very it's a very interesting game. So the theme of the game, which is what initially appealed 
uh, to me about envelopes of cash is, as I say, about uh, collegiate level football. And as a coach, what you're going to be doing is recruiting various athletes. Now, because these are student athletes and because student athleticism is all about amateurism and there's certainly no money involved anywhere in the endeavor ever, ever. That is why you have them sign away their rights to their name, their image, and their likeness. And that is why you sell the television rights for many, many millions of dollars to enforce a spirit of amateurism. These are student athletes. These are academics, really. And I, how dare you? Anyway, uh, the satire is very redolent in envelopes of cash. And this is not coming from some outside observer. As I say, uh, this is Andy Schwartz's period, area of study. He knows what he's talking about. And so constantly, as a consequence, what you do is you get to get into your recruiting bus and go grease the palms under the table of some kid out there somewhere with dreams of making it big in the NCAA or the NFL. In theory, this doesn't happen. In practice, it happens all the time. And the amount of money that gets sloshing around here in the actual en endeavor that in theory is, you know, not supposed to touch any of the athletes, it's kind of a, and for what it's worth, as an outside observer, Again, I don't really know a whole lot about sports. I knew a little bit about universities, and I can tell you about the pernicious effect of some aspects of athletics programs in universities. But the uh, it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. So there's millions and millions and millions of dollars to be had. You basically are ending up in a situation where you either have the individual sign away all their rights, and so all the money is being made by all the people who don't actually generate the value, and so you have these people working for no remuneration, or you have an instance where whatever surface superficial gesture you might have towards them being a student is drowned out by the fact that they are already multi-million uh, generating superstars. Anyway, it's a whole thing. And if you find that more ass interesting, or at least amusing, from a satirical perspective, Envelopes of Cash is for you. So there's three different rule books, three different ways to play, but it's more like levels of difficulty. Or not difficulty of game or difficulty of learning. Like there's the basic campaign intro and then there's the family weight style and then there's the full Euro uh, version. And we have only played the full version for Correct. what it's worth. And so the setup is no joke. Lots of tokens to spread around the board. Uh, lots of players to spread around the board. And then there's the giant deck of cards. And I really feel as though this is uh, the game that Arc Nova is not. Because it mm. has this giant deck of cards that you're cycling through that that all of the cards, no, I shouldn't say all the cards, more of the cards are useful to you or you can manipulate in a way that will be useful for, to you. You're never going to be in an instance where there are no cards that will help you in no way. And so it, it's very interesting how the, the cards work. You have a hand of cards that you get dealt every turn. You also have a sideboard of your own cards. Your and stash. Then your stash. And then you have a pool of all the cards that are discarded. And then every month, because there's 12 turns in the game, one for every month of the year. So you're going to, you're going to be able to play 12 cards max, max per game. So at the beginning of every turn, you have to play a card. And now you can play a card from the hand cards that you were just dealt from your stash, or you can choose one from the discard pool. Either way, the two cards that you got dealt or only one left, if you've, if that's the one you play, will go into the discard pile and then you're ready to go. The key challenge, though, in terms of designing a tableau builder is, as you say, managing the deck. You know, there's the Arc Nova problem where a lot of cards are unplayable. There are uh, sometimes in, in these tableau builders, you end up in these endless turn where one key card is keying off the other. And I really think that Envelopes of Cash does a very, very good job of navigating between a lot of the polar extremes that, that define a lot of tableau builders. For one thing, as you say, you can only put out 12 cards, realistically. Uh, in many games, not even all of them will, will, will go out. You have a good influx of choice round on round, but not an overwhelming amount. So you can kind of figure out where you're going to go and be reactive. But the key thing that I like in terms of how cards work is how it dovetails with the economy. Because in envelopes of cash, there are fundamentally two different kinds of currencies. There are your booster bucks, and this is what your official budget is. And this can be spent on a variety of things. And then there are the eponymous envelopes of cash. They come in different colors. Thematically, these are supposed to represent different kinds of bribes. You know, concert tickets versus cars with scrubbed licenses versus designer clothing. 
in practice, though, what it really means is, is I think, more appropriately, thematically, regional connections. You know, I know a guy who runs a dealer outside Lubbock, and so I'm able to hook up a guy close to Lubbock with that Toyota Supra he really wants, or what have you. That's right. And the way this is managed is that you roll a, a die for each of these colors, and it's a six-sided die, and then you get to draft two of them, and then you make the arduous decision, <laughs> the hardest decision yep. in the game, is... You can either take the value, but you'll get it that many months later, or you can take half the value and take it now or any time any time in the future. Yeah. You desperately need purple currency. You roll you roll to five. You want that purple currency five turns from now? Do you have a sense of what you're going to be doing five turns from now? Well, then by all means, take the five. More is better. But if you desperately need it now, you can pocket the two right now. That's okay. And... At the end of the turn, they expire. You might be thinking, oh, I'll just take the maximum all the time. No, you can only use them in the month that they're generated. And so consequently, there's always this pressure. And again, thematically, it makes perfect sense. These are corrupt deals. You can't just stick them in an account somewhere and expect them to be around forever. And so consequently, you have this lovely intersection of the strategic horizon about where your cash is coming from, what you're going to be having in future turns, when you might be able to afford to put out that card you drafted in turn two, but is super expensive. Looking down to turn six, you know you'll be able to put it into play then. Or maybe there's the pressure to get it out sooner, and so you engage in very, very expensive transactions to make that happen. And so there's a virtue in planning ahead as well as the virtue of being reactive, responding to what the dice give you or sometimes making the dice bend to your will. That crucial economic element, which, by the way, is more or less inspired directly from Macau by Stefan Feld, more on that later, is one of the key drivers about how not only you put cards into play, but also how you draft players. Because players as well are paid for, because you can't, you're not supposed to be paying the players to sign with you. But in point of fact, you pay them with the envelopes of cash. So here you are with all these different demands on your economy, and the economy is, shall we say, fickle. Yes. So you've rolled your dice, you decide if you're going to take money now or later. Maybe you've, maybe this is the fourth turn and you've, and you've put money ahead. And so now it all comes, comes crashing in. You've got all this money. Hope you're still in the Midwest. So now these cards that you've put into the months, you can now spend these envelopes of cash and they all have different costs on them. You can now spend these envelopes of cash to put them into your play area. And then, like Mark said, you can also use these envelopes of cash to buy the players. They're all worth a certain number of points and they all also trigger off some cards if you've got them in play. And they also, you also have like a little checklist on the side of uh, a list of players that you need to get a bunch of points. But in order to recruit these players, you have to drive around your bus. And near the beginning of the game, you get all these free movement points. <laughs> Man, we're freewheeling now, Mark. We're crossing the USA. Yep. Gas is free. <laughs> times, times are great. And then, guess what? Near the end, you get no free movement. Yep. And you're starting to spend these envelopes of cash just so you can move your bus one space. And 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 it's not as though you're moving from city to city. There are spaces in between the cities that you have to- There are cities there, Walker. Just because you and I haven't heard of them doesn't mean that people don't live there. But the Fine, ones that good, decent people. The ones that you need to get to. Yeah. And so you're spending... Those people... What you're saying is those people may be fine, good, and decent, but they haven't produced a good kicker, and so you don't care about them. That's right. <laughs> and so you're slogging through near the end and uh, it's, it's trying to figure out where you're going to get this extra money. Can, can I admit, therefore, of a petty grievance? Because let me, let me just put cards on the table. In terms of theming, both the overall theme of the game and how well the theme was integrated into the gameplay, Envelopes of Cash is hands down one of the best games I've played in years. No two ways about it. That makes some of the thematic disconnects more painful for me. And there are two in particular. Number one, why is it the only illegal, illicit money that makes your bus, your recruiting bus move faster? I realize I'm being petty, but as I say, how good the rest of it is makes these things stand out. Presumably, being able to move your recruiting team around the country is a thing you could do with legitimate booster dollars, but you can't. The other thing is, is that core elements of your football program, or indeed core elements of the university itself, are also paid with these illicit money. So, for example, there's a there are cards in the game that don't really relate to the football program directly, like having a chancellor or a provost. Those you get through the bribes. I don't think that's how it really works. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to say there isn't bribing. If you've been paying attention to local media, Queen's University only got a provost by virtue of in the middle of a hiring freeze doing a spousal hire for the provost's spouse. 
there are things you can do, but these are not sub Rosa payments with designer clothing and literal envelopes of cash. Anyway, I, I only give voice to this in part to emphasize how great the rest of the theming is. And a lot of the cards do make sense that they would be paid for through illicit payments. Like the tech bro millionaire who swings by and showers you with largesse because you've already bribed him in the context of your football program. That I can easily believe. But I, it does bother me a little bit that getting your bus from point A to point B, which is a huge element of the game and dovetails with the economy really, really, really well doesn't dovetail thematically with the economy. I can forgive the fact that over the course of an entire month, your bus can barely get out of the get out of New England. That's fine. I can hand wave that away in terms of the temporality. But the fact that it can't be paid for with booster bucks, eh, a bit of an issue. So like Mark said, you have to make sure you spend all your bribe money by the end of the month. And it's not as though they make it so you just waste it. They have all these little mechanisms that allow you to to punch out little areas like you can spend it to start moving towards the city that you're going to next, unless you're already in the city that you want to go to, then too bad. But then you get to uh, put it into Las Vegas and gamble with it. Or you can send a runner uh, off to another city and you can sort of leave your money sitting on the doorstep. You make a down payment. Down payment. <laughs> you're like, you throw money at, at, at the kicker. You put, you put that linebacker on layaway. Yeah, the, just so. And and so it's not terrible. It's just another pressure. Yeah, and if you have put the right cards in play, you will find you do not have as many leftover envelopes in, in play. So again, this is this is an economy you have to ride the vicissitudes of, but it simultaneously build an engine that can deal with whatever economic shortfalls you have or with whatever economic surpluses you have. I really do appreciate it at times when in a Euro game, an economic surplus is a problem. I mean, it's not going to lose your points, but you have to deal with the fact that it's very much feast or famine in many cases. Is, you know, sometime you're drowning on the envelopes and you don't have enough cards to put into play or not enough things to do with them. And then the other time you're desperately spending everything you have for that one gray envelope you desperately need. I appreciate that. It, it, it gives some contour and, and rhythm to the game. True. And then there's the booster bucks that Mark was talking about. They have a little mechanism for that at the end. It's pretty well just buying victory points. So if you somehow, with the cards, create this booster buck economy, then you can start using it to buy victory points. Yeah, running marketing campaigns, which is absolutely a thing universities do. And then you get to the end of the game. Yeah, so you have uh, a lot of scoring over the course of the game for the players you hire. You also get a big whack of points from... And again, this 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 makes set collections so much more uh, thematically satisfying. You get bonus points based on the number of different positions for which you've drafted. So if you have five offensive linemen, uh, that is not as remunerative as having a full offensive line. And consequently, that's, you know, more satisfying than the traditional Euro thing of, well, this had a this color and this had this other color. Do you have a full set? Now, another bonus you have, and I confess I did a little bit of poking into this, and I cannot find any direct thematic analog. You know far, far more about sports than I do, Walker. Uh, you also get a bonus for having recruited a whole bunch of athletes from the same geographic region. Does that make a whole lot of sense in terms of recruiting? I don't... Maybe for a fan base? But the thing is, like, if you were... Okay, if you're recruiting for Ole Miss, right? And you can say, all of these people are from Mississippi. That would make a certain degree of sense. But if you're recruiting from Ole Miss and you can say, all of these people are from Maine, I don't think that would fly. <laughs> no, not really. I'm not sure of the reasoning. Anyway, it's, it's, it's another... Maybe they get together. They Maybe they form a team better because they have more... more relationship you know they can relate to each other better and this is why you're my jock whisperer sure yeah. that works for me all look all i need again when when the rest of the theming is of this quality and it's an excellent satirical examination of of something that's actually a relatively major social issue i just need the surface level of justification and i'm there there you go team cohesion thank you walker no problem <laughs> and then we have what it's that boston accent you can't really understand it if you're from another part of the that's country that's right just so and then we have like i said you have the little checklist right you have five different positions that you need to fill if yep. you did at least three you get five points if you did all five then you get 15 points yeah and again like you know your star quarterback is retiring or sorry retiring <laughs> your star quarterback is 
injured or graduated or what have you or, or scouted. So you desperately need a new quarterback. And so at the start of the game, you get a random list of things you'd really, really like. And that's another source of, of little bonus points. And this is not even covering all what all these different cards do. There's this giant yeah. stack and there's cards that you can activate during your turn. They get you more bucks or get you bonus bucks or help you move the bus or give you extra points depending on the player that you hired. All sorts of different things going on. And I'd also like to give a shout out to the way the rule book was written. It's very clear. It's very humorous, as is appropriate, because we're dealing with a satirical theme. And also, uh, Andy Swartz does something that far too few designers do. Uh, he does it actually to, uh, if, if anything, far more than he has to. He gives credit to other designs when he has lifted or borrowed or been inspired by a mechanism from another design. So, for example, I commented that the one of the key economic conceits is directly from Stefan Feld's game Macau. Uh, this is absolutely something that's called out in the rule book by the designer himself. He goes to the extent, as I say, he does it when he doesn't even need to. The list of players that you're supposed to satisfy, he calls that out. He said, this was this this is uh, indirectly inspired by Ticket to Ride's root cards. I'm like, dude, these don't look much like Ticket to Ride root cards, but good on you for giving credit where credit is due. On the one hand, my initial reaction was maybe this is because he's an academic, and academics, one thing that's drilled into us is you've got to give credit for everything that has inspired you or your reference. But there are a lot of board gamer academics and board game designer academics, and not a lot of them give credit where credit is due. And so I really, really appreciate Andy Schwartz for giving the, the shout out to the other designers when he has been inspired by their work. So Envelopes of Cash is, to my mind, one of those great marriages of tremendously well-done theming as well as solid Euro mechanisms. You can come for the theme, you can stay for the economic management, and so it can appeal to a lot of people from a lot of different perspectives. Unless, of course, you have someone who's really into college football and doesn't really want to analyze it from a satirical lens. I don't know that they would necessarily be at it. Look, my only serious relationship to college football is once I asked my friend Josephus to explain to me how the BCS works. What followed was 45 minutes of him explaining the intricacies of it, and I sincerely, no joke, felt less sane at the end of his explanation. But as somebody who cares very deeply about the, the education system and about economic reform and giving agency to people who are generating lots of value, uh, the fact that Envelopes of Cash exists uh, makes me very, very happy, and I very much enjoy playing it besides. Yep, if you want a game where you're under constant economic pressure and funny satirical silliness, I will play Envelopes of Cash anytime. I'd have to say my biggest negative against envelopes of cash is that on the back of the box, there's this big block quote from some loser idiot. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. It made me almost not want to play it. Makes me sick to my stomach. It does. Yeah. Yeah. That is envelopes of cash by Andy Schwartz. The solo mode is also pretty darn good. It's on board game arena. It is also on board game arena. You can play the solo version. You can play the multiplayer version. Go to town as it were. That player from Missouri is not getting any younger. So that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find all our information and many links at SoWrongGames.com. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. But thank you for having decided to spend time with us, and we hope to see you again soon. Please do take care. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>